Awesome. That's me. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and sea country, the Gimoi, Wallabari, Dinji, and Irganji peoples, and pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I extend that acknowledgement to all the traditional custodians of the Great Barrier Reef and any First Nations people in the audience today and online. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors from CSIRO, to the Queensland Department of Environment and and Science, C2O Consulting, and DQ. This work has been funded by the Reef Trust Partnership with contributions from the Queensland Government and the five regional report card partnerships of the Great Barrier Reef region. And the origins of this work came out of interest that was generated at this symposium last year. Our studies about trust and mistrust in the science that underpins management of the Great Barrier Reef and its catchment. We're at a pivotal point in reef protection and management. Increasing pressures on the reef and connected ecosystems have led to unprecedented levels of intervention by reef scientists and managers. Strong political will and public support drives this mission. The success of this mission will be hugely dependent on sustaining that political will and public support, but that support is not guaranteed to be self-sustaining and trust in the science that underpins our understanding of the problems and risks plays a critical role. But what happens if public trust in that science declines? Well, it's important to note that healthy skepticism is good for science, and an informed questioning public are important features of a healthy governance system. And as Lacey and others wrote in 2018, excessive trust can lead to perverse outcomes. However, mistrust based on misinformation and disinformation is not a healthy thing, and it can lead to severe negative consequences. And if you happen to follow certain media outlets, you might get an impression that some people are trying to undermine trust in reef and water quality science. Viewpoints like those that you see here are now a regular feature in our landscape, and there are concerns that this might be contributing to a decline in public trust in reef science. So in the context of our study, we ask, how much mistrust is there in our region? Is it increasing? What is it based on and how should we deal with it? The aims of our study were therefore firstly to gain a better understanding of the issue by measuring the prevalence of mistrust in reef and water quality science in the region and identifying factors that are associated with that mistrust. And secondly, to uncover and share insights that might help efforts to rebuild trust. This involved a typological deep dive to understand groups of people with varying degrees of trust, to challenge any assumptions or stereotypes, and to hopefully find some common ground that can serve as a basis for better engagement with communities. We used a publicly available data set provided by the CELTEM team at CSIRO. The data are from surveys conducted by regional report card partnerships in November 2021 of residents in four major catchment areas. Our sample size is 1,877 respondents who answered questions about their uses, benefits, and values associated with uh, these waterways, their perceptions of waterway health, problems, and threats, and a bunch of questions about waterway stewardship, governance, and their trust in waterway science and management. We focused on one question in particular as a basis of our typology. Respondents gave a rating from one to 10, indicating the extent to which they trust the science about waterway health and management. Interestingly, 31% of the sample gave a rating of five or below, indicating a degree of distrust. We then categorized our respondents into four groups. People who gave a rating of one or two were considered strongly skeptical of the science, Ratings of three to five were considered mildly skeptical. Between six and eight were considered mildly trusting and ratings of nine or 10 were considered strongly trusting. And by comparing some basic descriptive uh, details, we can already see some interesting differences between those groups. I can only show you a few of our results today to give you a flavor of the insights and how they can help to inform engagement with stakeholders and the wider public. Please note that this work is not yet published so no photographs, please, and don't share it just yet. All right, results. 
Respondents rated the extent to which they valued certain aspects of the waterways in their region. This figure doesn't show those ratings. Instead, it shows the regression between those ratings and respondents' ratings of trust in the science. Here, where the gray horizontal bars intersect with the dotted zero line, that means there's no significant relationship. But for four of these variables at top in blue, we can see that there is a significant positive association between trust in the science and the extent to which people value their local waterways for recreation, for their existence, and so on. In plain English, people who are more trusting in the science were more likely to value these things higher than people who were less trusting of the science. Below that in red, we can see that there is a significant negative relationship, meaning people who mistrust the science are more likely to value their waterways for their contribution to local agriculture. Now, sometimes statistical results like these can be misleading or misinterpreted. So let's look more closely at four of these groups, at our four groups, I'm so sorry. Now, do our skeptics not value waterways for their existence? We can see that they do, in fact, appreciate existence values with a mean rating above eight on the 10 point scale. And this is only slightly lower than our other four groups. So it would be unfair of us to build a typological description by interpreting the regression alone. Let's briefly look at another. For this one, the extent to which people value waterways as an attraction for tourists, the error bar is smaller and the difference between the mean scores is more pronounced. So we're standing on firmer ground to say that people who are skeptical of the science are less inclined to value tourism in their region's waterways. I'll move a bit faster because of the 10 minutes. Let's look at perceptions of ecosystem threats. Respondents rated the extent to which they perceive those things to be a current threat to waterways in their region. Climate change is a clear standout here. So this shows that recognition of climate change as a threat is strongly associated with trust in science. And yes, when we compare the mean scores of our four groups on the response scale, there is indeed a very clear difference. But for our perceptions of tourism as a threat, there isn't really a meaningful difference. Yes, the regression is significant, but we'd be remiss to say that science skeptics are, science skeptics are seeing tourism as a major threat to waterways. And looking at all the gray bars in the middle, we can see that there is no significant relationship between trust in the science and perceptions of these things as a threat to waterways. So in essence, science skepticism does not affect how people perceive most of the threats to waterways. It's really just climate change. What about perceptions of the health of different habitats? The survey asked respondents to rate the health of all these different waterways as either poor, fair or good. And we can see lots of non-significant results, meaning that science skepticism doesn't appear to affect how people perceive the health of these habitats, except for inshore coral reefs. There's a clear difference of perception here. And science skeptics seem to perceive inshore coral reefs to be in better health than our trusting groups. The last result slide compares respondents' ratings of agreement with statements about their motivation and capacity to contribute to waterways stewardship activities. These are enabling factors associated with participation in stewardship actions. The three significant correlations here suggest that people who are more trusting of the science have a greater sense of personal responsibility to contribute and they want to do more to help and that they feel like they can make a personal difference to improve waterway health in their region. This can also be described as self-efficacy and looking at the mean scores for our groups, it seems that perhaps people who are less trusting of the science feel less empowered to help address the problems and threats of their regional waterways. Based on these results, we have some take home messages and insights that are emerging. Firstly, we found more similarities than differences between people who trust the science and those who do not. So there is plenty of common ground on which to build constructive communication and engagement. And there are a few important differences that we should be aware of. For one, 
People who are skeptical of the science are longer term residents with more lived experience of their region and its waterways. It is important that their knowledge is recognized, valued and respected. Perceptions of some threats differ with climate change being a clear standout. But mostly we have shared perceptions of ecosystem health and problems. So a lack of trust doesn't seem to affect how one sees the environment. We also saw that uh, people who mistrust the science are more likely to feel disempowered about their role in improving waterway health. An engagement that focuses on collective actions and seeks to empower people might contribute to better outcomes. So we hope that this work will help to improve community engagement and ultimately help to uh, improve collective efforts to protect the ecosystems on which we all depend. And of course, we can take some inspiration from this morning's keynote from uh, Professor Foxwell Norton. Thank you for listening today. And a quick shout out to Emily Chamberlain, who helped us create these amazing plots that you see. She's actually standing right there at the back of the room. So thanks, Emily. And thank you all. <laughs>